Formula One on Five Live. Welcome to the Checkered Flag podcast, the post-Spanish Grand Prix qualifying podcast. And it was Max Verstappen in his Red Bull who achieved his 24th career pole. He will start in front of Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris, the top three. Gasly Hamilton, the top five. Then it's Stroll, Ocon, Hulkenberg, Alonso and Piastri that round out the top 10 but it was imperious from max verstappen to dissect it all with myself harry benjamin is the former mclaren mechanic mark Priestley, and the bbc's chief f1 writer andrew benson before we dive into all things max verstappen let's see what he had to say yeah it was very enjoyable the whole weekend again um to to drive you know we really got the car in a good window and um yeah of course then in qualifying when you can really push it to the to the limit um yeah we got that lap out of it so of course, very pleased with that, but of course the, the points are tomorrow's, and that's where we have to really focus on. But uh, hopefully, if you have a good first, well, start, first lap, then we can settle into our own pace and um, yeah, can do our own race. You mentioned having a good first, you know, start and, and first lap. It's a long run down to turn one. You yourself know that having you know gone toe to toe with Lewis here in 2021. What's the game plan for you know that initial you know start to try and stay ahead? Yeah, I mean honestly, just a clean getaway. Um, but even then, even if we lose the position, I think we have a fast car and we can we can challenge them again afterwards. But um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. I'm not too worried about it. Mark Verstappen was on it from Friday. Really, we weren't looking at anybody else to get pole. No, he's been on it since the start of the season, really, hasn't he? I mean, he's uh, he came into this weekend with a circuit that's had changes to it, with rivals that have brought upgrades in various forms, Ferrari notably, Mercedes as well, and yet still that Red Bull car, particularly in the hands, in fact, only in the hands of Max Verstappen so far, looks so dominant that I can't see anybody getting close. Qualifying was a real opportunity where we see all the cars laid out, their performances on the line, comparable conditions, and Max was just streaks ahead of everybody. I mean, Andrew, is there really much more to say about Max after that? Well, we're looking at the three-time world champion at the end of the year, or not the end of the year, aren't we? Uh, I don't know when he's going to win it. Singapore, maybe Japan, Austin at the latest, I would say. I mean, and we haven't mentioned it yet, but it's another terrible, terrible day for Sergio Perez. He was really downcast after Monaco. He had a, you know, he was dire in Monaco. He drove really badly, lots of errors. And unfortunately, he sounded, he sort of got himself back in the right headspace, it sounded, on Thursday. He was being quite defiant. It's not over yet, but I'm afraid it really is. He's down in 11th place today. It was his own error again. He went off at turn five um, and then couldn't recover in time to get out of the second session. So it's going to be another, unless something goes wrong for Verstappen, it's going to be another bunch of points for him, another big step forward in the championship. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, well, coming into this weekend, Sergio Perez, after not scoring any points in Monaco, the gap to his teammate Verstappen is 39 points. Perez will start from 11th on the grid. Let's hear from him. Well, Chaco, I know this isn't where you want to be on a Saturday afternoon. I know you want to be out there in Q3. Was it just a little bit of moisture you picked up on the kerb? Yeah, I think it was a little bit damp uh, going into turn turn five and I end up losing the, the car, unfortunately. Now, the difference between this weekend and Monaco is, of course, you can actually overtake here. So at this point, looking at where you will start, where do you think you might finish? Well, I hope I can recover everything and, and get to the podium. That would be ideal, you know, an ideal scenario for, for us tomorrow. But we will try everything we possibly can. Good luck with that. Thanks. Well, naturally sounding downhearted, Mark, but how do Red Bull look at this as well? Because they really need Perez to be the, the ultimate backup to Verstappen. They need him to be second and to occasionally win if Verstappen cannot. He can't do that from 11th. Well, do they? <laughs> Max Verstappen's so dominant, you feel he could win both championships on his own this year. And I, and I think, you know, we joke about that, but I kind of think that's genuinely the case. Yeah, yeah. If Sergio <laughs> Perez can pick up a few points here and there, that's probably enough. I mean, I totally understand what you're saying. Of course, that's right. They need him in the longer term, in the bigger picture, as other teams begin to converge in terms of performance, which is going to happen over the next few years. This is a real opportunity for Red Bull. They've come out the blocks, you know, hit the ground running with a new version of Formula One starting last year. They've only extended that lead this year, but that's not going to last forever. So they do need a teammate to Max to be closer. 
And the, the pressure is piling on Sergio, but I mean, most of that pressure will come from himself. You know, he wants to do better than this. He wants to be seen as a genuine contender. I think the reality is most people don't see him as that, and most people see him as a decent number two. That's probably all the team need him to be. Well, let's see what Perez can do in the race on Sunday. He'll go from 11th. Uh, starting in second, though, Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari. That is his best start of the season. A front row start as well for the first time uh, at his home Grand Prix. It was excellent uh, running from the Ferrari, which are running new upgrades. Uh, yeah, it was a very good lap. It was, um, I think it almost sort of came out the blue to some extent because I don't think we've seen the Ferrari that Ferrari wanted to put on display this weekend. It's a quite a, a sort of raft of changes they've brought with new side pods, new bodywork, new floor to match that as well. They've played the, the sort of chances down coming into the weekend, but I think it's quite a significant change of concept. And that, you know, should, in theory at least, bring performance. I don't think we necessarily saw that. It's a really solid lap from Carlos Sainz, but his teammate absolutely nowhere. Charles Leclerc down in 19th. Maybe he's got some problems with the car to, see, to be that far off the pace. But I think um, th th what, we've, what we see with the Ferrari upgrade is hopefully a basis for them to develop further in the future. You know, a different direction which might unlock further opportunity. This is the very first time we've seen it on track. So maybe just the beginning of a, of a, of a new period of Ferrari where they can build from. Yeah, Leclerc, I think, would probably have been second, wouldn't he? But he was talking about having a problem with the car. He said the left-hand side didn't feel right, the, but the balance was extremely difficult. Not the first time we've heard a Ferrari driver talking about extremely difficult balance. Um, Science was saying in the press conference that he, he thought that's part of the nature of the car. If they get it in the right window, it can be it's, it's OK to drive. If they're not in the right window, it can be really bad. But it sounded from what Leclerc was saying that it was something more than that. There was something fundamental about the setup of the car that they'd got wrong between the final practice session when he said, when Leclerc said the car was feeling really good and qualifying. But I think when we look down the grid, what we're seeing today is a lot of, um, of the effect of a session that started with a damp track in cool conditions and as a result it was very easy to make mistakes we saw Perez make a mistake we saw Fernando Alonso make a mistake which is really rare I think he, he's going to be one of the people who's really kicking himself this evening because he probably could have been on the front row too with uh, instead of science with the staff and given the pace of that Aston Martin but he went off on his very first lap at the final corner and had a very damaged floor after that. Aston Martin just told me that the damage was significant, which will mean a number of tenths of a second. Um, and he's behind Lance Stroll, his teammate, which is not where we've expected him to be. And through the grid, we saw those sorts of errors. Um, so I think, and, and I think it's also had an effect on the flip side of that. Lando Norris just talking about how he thinks the cool conditions played to McLaren's hands. They struggle, the hotter it gets. Uh, and we see a Haas in eighth place. It's going to be a combination of conditions, tyre temperatures, all sorts that have led to this slightly topsy-turvy grid. Well, it certainly is a topsy-turvy grid, but going from second to borrow, let's hear from uh, Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari. It is very special. I think it's the maximum we could do today. We put ourselves in the best possible position to try and get a podium tomorrow, which I think still will be tough with the Mercedes, the Astons and Checo coming from behind. But today it was a tricky day, tricky conditions out there, and we still managed to to put everything together and, uh, and do a good job. How tricky was it out there for you guys? Very tricky, especially you one with how tight the margins are. A couple of damp patches here and there to get it together in Q1 was, uh, with the pressure was uh, well, uh, high, high stress. You've obviously talked about the guys coming from the back, but let's look forward. Can you, what would, how much would it mean to you to win here tomorrow in well, front of your fans? It would mean, mean everything, but I also know Max is uh, in a planet in, of his own, in a league of his own, you know, and uh, it would, we would need a, a reliability issue or a very big mistake by Red Bull or him to, in order for us to, to win tomorrow. If a uh, normal race, I think the podium has to be our target and be best of the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so that's your, your top two then. Lando Norris, uh, as Andrew mentioned, in the McLaren uh, going from third, perhaps then making uh, gains after the disasters for the likes of uh, Perez and Leclerc, as we've discussed. But a fantastic uh, result there, Mark, for, for McLaren. Oscar Piastri up into the top ten as well. Not quite there with his teammate Norris. Uh, but McLaren, this pace seems to have come 
a little bit out of nowhere. Well, I, I actually think Andrew's hit the nail on the head there. I think the conditions, particularly the lower temperatures, have really made a massive difference. We know how significant tyre temperature can be to the performance of your car. You get it a few degrees inside the window, the car really comes alive and genuinely works. It can add literally a second a lap around some longer circuits. You get it just outside that window and you can have the opposite effect. Charles Leclerc, we just mentioned him down in 19th, talking about a problem with the car. I've had so many drivers talk about that being convinced that something's broken and it's actually just that they didn't get the tyres into the right window and it has such a massive impact on how it feels. So I think with all the troubles that it caused Charles Leclerc, I think for Lando Norris, it just put them into that window. Their car came alive in those conditions and we see the result, him up in third place. Well, let's hear it from a third place man now. Hi, Lando. Hello. Congratulations. The car just seemed to come alive today. Car? Yeah, on you as well. There we sorry. go, that's more like it. Oh, sorry, I forgot myself. P3, you've got to be absolutely ecstatic with that. I'm just playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a few different reasons, I guess. The car felt, the car definitely felt good. We made some small little tweaks, nothing big, but it seemed to definitely help the car move in the right direction. Um, the conditions, colder, colder conditions, people just seem to struggle a lot. You know, you see a lot of people locking up and going off, making mistakes, and uh, I never necessarily felt like that, so... Um, was yeah just also close you know like i make one tenth mistake and i'm what five positions back and um i don't look like uh, as much of a hero as i do as i do now so uh many different different things that come into it but uh, in the end the team's done a good job with the car i felt confident with it um, and i put in some nice laps and uh when you put it together then we get p3 how tricky was it out there because we did see a number of drivers especially very experienced ones make some mistakes yeah. so how tricky was it out there for you um i mean i'm surprised because I wouldn't say it was that tricky, uh, but the track was quick, you know, 12.3 by Max, 12.7 by me. It was the quickest we've been all weekend by over a second and a bit. Um, I don't know. I don't know what everyone was struggling with. Um, so I guess it was difficult in Q1 with the wet patch between 10 and 11, where you saw most of the people spin. But the rest of it, uh, I'm not sure. Eyes on the podium tour? Absolutely not. Eyes are in my mirrors. So Lando Norris will start from third place for the Spanish Grand Prix. It's McLaren's first top three start at this track since Lewis Hamilton started in third back in 2011. So they'll be buoyed by that. Your top three will be Verstappen on pole position in front of Sainz and Norris. Pierre Gasly in the Alpine mark. Uh, continuing Alpine, steady progress it seems. Uh, he finished in fourth, but we are expecting some penalties to come his way. At the time of recording, nothing has been handed out yet. He's being investigated for impeding... Uh, uh, on a couple of counts, one in front of uh, Max Verstappen and the other one in front of Carlos Sainz during that qualifying session. Yeah, he's going to be a busy boy up and down at the stewards' room. Um, I think we're. I think from what I've seen, it's going to be a slam dunk penalty. He, uh, certainly one of them. I'm pretty sure both of them. So yeah, he will probably face a, a, a grid drop, um, unfortunately for Sunday. But the the encouraging signs are there with the performance of the car and that lap that puts him fourth on the provisional grid as it stands right now was a decent lap. It was a genuine lap. It was a genuine pace of the car. But it's kind of part of this topsy-turvy grid so there's a caveat assigned to all of these positions with people sort of slightly out of the predicted position there's a caveat is it just down to slightly weird cooler temperatures affecting everyone's tire temperatures and getting it wrong I and mean, we can argue that all day long however as a driver as a team you can only get the best out of your car in the conditions that are in front of you and they did it better than lots of other people today well, we'll wait to see what happens with Pierre Gasly and the possible penalties coming his way. Highly expected. Uh, that could promote Lewis Hamilton up a position in his Mercedes. And Andrew, uh, we're talking about the uh, the upgrades a lot coming in uh, for this weekend. Uh, Mercedes running that new concept, which they uh, showed in Monaco, getting the full proper range of it, perhaps uh, this time around at this uh, Barcelona Catalonia track. Uh, practice didn't look like it. They really. Uh, untapped much that potential but then Hamilton especially seemed to come alive a bit more in qualifying he did although at the end it's not looking that great when you start to look at the numbers he's nearly six uh, what is he he's uh, five tenths down on um, Verstappen and um, actually in second in the second part of qualifying he was only a couple of tenths off and at that point it was looking encouraging but he's about it's a short lap remember Harry and so that's about the margin that's been typical for Mercedes through the season and he's almost certainly been flattered by the fact that two people who would normally be ahead of him in Fernando Alonso and Charles Leclerc are behind. So that fifth place for Hamilton, OK, it's going to become fourth following Gasly's almost certain penalties. It would, in reality, 
have been seventh more likely. So then we wouldn't be talking about the Mercedes upgrades being quite so positive. Um, and actually, I think there's actually it's going to lead to really quite an interesting race. As long even even if overtaking is difficult, which it always tends to be around. Uh, Barcelona, because there's lots of cars out of position. So Lando Norris was saying he was shocked to be in third and he doesn't expect to be able to hang on to that into the race. Lance Stroll's in sixth and Aston Martin, he's not normally that quick. Alonso's down in ninth, he is really quick. Perez is down the field, he's really quick. Leclerc's at the back, okay, the Ferrari's not great in, in race trim normally, but maybe it'll be better. <laughs> but it's certainly a lot quicker than a lot of the cars in front of it. it could, we, we could have a really interesting afternoon on our hands tomorrow. It's going to be one to, uh, to dial in for, for sure. Well, it wasn't a, a session without incident, though, for Lewis Hamilton and the Mercedes team as he came together, Mark, with George Russell down into Turn 1. Yeah, in what actually could have been an incredibly dangerous incident. It's rare you see this between teammates, but coming down the start finish straight, which you're approaching 200 miles an hour on a flying lap there, as Lewis Hamilton was, he came up behind his teammate, George Russell, who appeared to see him in his mirrors and moved over to the right-hand side. That allowed a gap for Lewis to go into to overtake him. And as he went past, George Russell, with a Ferrari to his right-hand side, moved over to the left, squeezed Lewis onto the grass at that incredibly high speed. They touched. It ripped the front wing end plate off Lewis, Lewis Hamilton's car. They both survived to tell the story. But I'm sure that's going to be another one that the stewards are going to probably come down fairly heavily on. Yeah, as the time of recording, it is being investigated, but uh, a bit of a disaster qualifying session for George Russell. Uh, at the moment, 12th fastest, but we wait to see what happens there. Uh, he spoke to Rosanna a bit earlier. George, that looked like a pretty hairy moment between you and Lewis. Were you aware of what was meant to be happening and were you part of a plan? I hope that wasn't part of the plan because uh, not a good plan if it is, but... No, I think it's just big mis miscommunication. Um, a lot of traffic on the outlap. I was just looking ahead, trying to take the slipstream from, from Carlos, and the next thing Lewis was there. So, yeah, fortunately, nothing, nothing big happened, but just a bit disappointed to be out in Q2. Uh, really struggling with the car the whole session. Wasn't feeling the same as it did in qualifying, uh, in practice, sorry. And, um, yeah, that was kind of the maximum that I could, I could get out of it. So, not ideal, but a long way to mine. Were you trying to set up a toe or anything like that? It wasn't a choreography moment from the team? No, not between the two of us. I think um, there was cars on fast laps behind us. Um, I had to let Sainz pass in turn 13. You can't really see that far in the distance, and maybe Lewis was starting his lap. I don't even know if he was starting his lap or finishing his lap, but obviously not ideal for the both of us. Um, but that didn't really contribute towards the lack of pace. Well, there you go from George Russell then. We wonder where he will start this grid from, but at the moment it will be 12th place with a possible penalty coming the British races away. Uh, so, well, the big losses really were Perez, Russell, uh, Charles Leclerc as well. Uh, the big hitters losing out in qualifying. And that, as you've said, has jumbled up the grid quite nicely. Uh, but you do have a, a Lance Stroll up in sixth and Nico Hulkenberg in eighth. But they are both, uh, Mark, ahead of Fernando Alonso, who did suffer, as we've uh, mentioned already, damage going through uh, the gravel. But that's going to carry on the paint into Sunday's Grand Prix for him. Well, it will carry on in that he's starting further back on the grid. They'll be able to repair the car, of course, because it is accident damage. They're allowed to do that overnight and tomorrow morning ahead of the race starts. It should be a, a car that's back to, to sort of brand new condition. But he's starting that far down the, the order. So this is a tricky place to overtake. We've got a slightly new, or not slightly, quite significantly reprofiled end to the lap with two very fast right-hand corners in place of the old horrible little slow chicane. In theory, with cars now able to follow each other a little bit closer than they used to be in previous eras of this sport, we might encourage overtaking with that change. As cars come onto the start-finish straight faster, closer to each other, with that long straight potentially able to affect an overtake under DRS. So, look, anyone starting out of position with a faster car, I think there's still opportunities to move forward tomorrow. I agree, actually, because I, we expect tyre degradation to be a big thing, which is going to mean multiple pit stops. Not quite sure whether it be two or three, probably end up being two, because the teams like to limit the number of pit stops as much as they possibly can. But if the what we've got to remember about the Aston Martin is it's normally really good on its tyres. So if he can, you know, make advantage, take advantage, sorry, of, of that quality of the car and use his pace when he gets a bit of free air, he might even make it to the podium because he's been that quick this year. Because um, I, I suspect some of those people, well, Gasly's going to be taken out of his way already, we expect. 
some of the other people who are ahead of him, like Stroll, if Alonso's obviously quicker than him, they'll probably tell Stroll to get out of the way. So that's yeah. another one out of out of the way. Norris isn't going to be able to hang on in third, I wouldn't have thought, in normal conditions. So there's opportunities for people, even if at the moment it doesn't look great because Spain generally isn't that a, a good place for overtaking. Well, I think this is a, a tricky weekend for everybody because it's not been a clean weekend. It's not like you could have you could have built up into the groove all weekend with a similar set of conditions. You can't fine-tune your car all the way through each session, gradually building up to qualifying and then the race. It's been topsy-turvy. It's been all over the place. We've had rain. We've had cooler conditions than expected. We've had this change to the circuit, upgrades to the cars. I don't think anyone really, other than perhaps Verstappen, is absolutely comfortable or confident that whatever conditions we get tomorrow, they're going to have a good car underneath them or not. Yeah, well, six different teams occupying the top six spots on the grid tomorrow uh, for now with Gasly pending uh, a penalty. But it's going to be uh, setting up for a, a tasty Grand Prix nonetheless. If we go uh, to the lower ends of uh, qualifying, it was a good qualifying from... Oh. Just to make a point, it yeah. will still be six. Will it still be because six? Because Ocon will be the oh, guy. Of course. Isn't Ocon going to be the guy Alpine who moves for Alpine, yeah. yeah, it might be, yeah. Alpine for Alpine. You're absolutely right, Andrew. Uh, further down the field, uh, good laps from Joe Guan Yu in the Alfa Romeo, out qualifying Valtteri Bottas. Uh, I think it's worth a, a word on, on Nick DeVries out of qualifying uh, his teammate Yuki Sonoda for only the second time because at the start of qualifying, uh, where we had uh, a the wet weather on track wasn't chucking it down but there was certainly some light spitting rain and uh, certainly a few damp patches in that final sector particularly coming out of uh, turn 11 and into 12 which uh, Nick De Vries uh, couldn't get the hang of to begin no, with. No that's right he was a little bit sort of all over the place but both good and bad so on occasions he saw real promise and some really good laps and on other occasions he was really struggling didn't have the confidence going through the middle sector of the lap noticeably backing off because he's had a couple of moments where he he spun or or slid the car so didn't have the confidence to really commit through that middle part of the lap and yet he still ended up as you said a place ahead of his teammate which is a, a I guess a positive turn of events for him it certainly was positive there uh, De Vries uh, from 14th at the moment ahead of Sonoda Bottas Magnus and Albon Leclerc and then Logan Sargent after his off in free practice three good work from the uh, Williams mechanics uh, they did manage to get that Williams out uh, but he did set the slowest lap time well uh, keep an eye across the uh, bbc sport website uh, for updates on how the grid is affected after the penalties have been investigated and any may well be applied uh, but we will have full live coverage of the grand prix which gets going from two o'clock sunday across bbc radio five live my thanks to andrew benson to mark priestley i've been harry benjamin and this has been an ing production for bbc radio five live